Thank you. Um, we have some more people coming in from the waiting room. Just give it a minute. Okay. Welcome, welcome. Uh, all right, so I'm, I'm going to share my screen. We are, uh, we read the original text of the Talmud last week. And, um, and today we'll read the Ruth Calderon version. So I'm going to share the screen to refresh our memories about this story. We landed in a cave by the end of, of the story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, here we are. <clears throat> so I'll read through the story and then we'll just remind ourselves of some of the kind of themes and ideas. And are you letting him? David, David is coming. Great. David is arriving from Israel. David had a bit of a longer trip from Israel, but he's here. Welcome. <laughs> Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon were sitting together. And, Rabbi, and Yehuda ben Gerim was sitting beside them. So three rabbis and another person. Rabbi Yehuda began the conversation. How lovely are the deeds of this nation, the Romans. They have built marketplaces, bathhouses, and bridges. We talked about building up infrastructure. <clears throat> so Rabbi Yehuda says something good about the Romans. Rabbi Yossi remains neutral remain silent. Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai responded, everything they built was for themselves, meaning for their own values against our Jewish values. They built marketplaces to quarter harlots. They built bathhouses to beautify their own bodies. And they built bridges to collect tolls. Yehuda ben Gerim went and recounted what they had said. And eventually word reached the Roman authorities. The authorities proclaimed Yehuda, who elevated our stature, shall be elevated. Yassi, who remains silent, shall be exiled to Tsipori. Shimon, who denigrated us, shall be executed. So we have three, you know, the, the Goldilocks and the <laughs> three bears, <laughs> um, you know, too big, too small, just right. I mean, it's different, right? The one who is going to have a... Uh, a, a position, an elevated position in the government, and the one who um, who denigrated us will be put to death. And the one in the middle, we're not too happy with either. But okay, we'll we'll just let him be, just in another a little a little bit of an exile. Mm -hmm. Before he's not that far. So Shimon is at risk for his life, and the debate at hand is: Is the Roman civilization good or bad for the Jews? Um, is a bathhouse inherently immoral because it focuses us on the material? Or can a bathhouse be used for, I don't know, hygiene, <laughs> for, good, for good purposes? So Shimon and his son went and hid in the study house. Each day his wife would bring them bread and water. When the decree of the authorities intensified, he was in more trouble. Rabbi Shimon said to his son, Women are lightheaded. They'll torture her. She'll reveal our hiding place. We can't trust being in a, in a public place. So they went and hid in a cave. They really secluded themselves. Mm -hmm. Miraculously, a carob tree and a spring of water were created for them. They would sit buried up to their necks in sand each day and learn after having cast off their clothes. When it came time for prayer, they would emerge and get dressed and cover themselves and go out to pray. They would then cast off their clothes again so that they would not wear out. They remained in the cave for 12 years. So that was something we talked about. We don't know anything else about those 12 years other than this repetitive behavior. Until one day, Elijah the prophet shows up. Elijah came to the mouth of the cave and said, who will notify Bar Yochai that the Caesar has died and his decree has been annulled? So that's his way of notifying Bar Yochai that the Caesar has died. They emerged. They saw people who were never planting and sowing. They said, these people are forsaking eternal life and preoccupying themselves with mundane reality. And the world couldn't stand up to that. Everywhere that Rabbi Shimon and his son would cast their eyes would immediately burst into flame. A voice came out from heaven, a batkol. 
a voice, a heavenly voice said to them, have you emerged in order to destroy my world? Return to your cave. Return to your cave in order to protect the world. They remained there for 12 months. Okay, this time not 12 years, but 12 months. They reasoned the sentence of evildoers in hell lasts for 12 months. It's enough time for transformation. We talked about that. A voice came out from heaven and said to them, after these 12 months, go out from your caves. They emerged. Everything that Rabbi Elazar would destroy, his father, Rabbi Shimon, would restore. We talked about that, the way that the sun now is sort of an extremist. His, his gaze is burning things up, but Rabbi Shimon ha, is tempered a little bit and he can restore anything that his son uh, destroys. And Rabbi Shimon says to him, my son, the world can suffice with me and you. Hmm. So I don't want to talk too much. I want, that was like the Chazara part mm -hmm. of the class. That was the review. And now we get to see what our friend Ruth Calderon has done to fix. Just a fast question. Any questions I was going to say of clarification before we move? Yeah, forward. a fast question. Um, what was Rabbi Shimon's understanding of why he was being punished? Because this act of looking at the plant and the sowing and punished every, in what way? Well, that he, they said, go back to your cave. Oh, did you read that as punishment? I didn't read that as a punishment. Well, yeah. Would you destroy my world? Go back. You know, so you can't, you, I think you it, can't handle it's protective truth. of the world. Yeah, I understand. But, but not uh, so punitive. You, I didn't read it as oh. punitive. I don't know if others read it that okay, way. I did. This sense of, I, uh, I, I go back to the cave. I saw it as, as a punishment. Yeah. I, I, uh huh. Is it because if you of the can't reference? handle the, the reality of Was what's it, outside the cave? Um, go back and, and think for another 12 years. Sure. Uh, so, um, I don't think Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai did something wrong. I see it as you having done 12 years in the cave and the world are not, uh, are incongruous. Yeah, but, or yeah, except that, except that his behavior or the result of his looking and it bursting into flames to me, was a judgment that, okay. that Shimon was making. Like, what, you've all turned into farmers? What happened to studying in the yeshiva? Yeah. And, and so yeah. God somehow said, you know, go back and think about what you did. I, I, that's yeah, I agree with Gloria, because then it says they reasoned. They themselves <clears throat> found, looked for an explanation as to why they yeah. were told to go back to the cave. Yeah. And yeah. they reasoned a sentence of evildoers and yeah. hell lasts for 12 months. Well, by analogy, we are evildoers, yeah. so we should be in the cave yeah. another 12 months. Yeah. But I wonder curious, if they, the, what um, their, his reflection was. That's what I was. Yeah. Uh, again, I don't see, I still don't see it that way. I understand that you could read it that way, given that was what I was thinking, the reference to Gehenna being 12 months long. Mm -hmm. um, anyone on the Zoom want to chime in on this debate? Did Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai do something wrong after 12 years having burned up everything in his sight? Is he being punished? I, to I, tend, to the to with, David. I tend to agree with Gloria. You know, from the text, it seems that they'd done something guilty. Another thought occurred to me. They never mentioned that they washed for 12 years. <laughs> and also, why on earth would they bury themselves up to their heads? I, I, it's almost a joke. I don't see the point of it. Can you hear me? Oops. Can you hear me? No, you can't. I hear you. And I'm in the yeah. Do not hear hear you. We hear you. Well, the sand would keep them clean for one. You didn't mute it, did you? No. No, we were just trying to make it a little louder. That's all. Rafael, did you hear me? Yes, David. Do you hear me now? Oh, so you didn't hear me just now? We did. We. Did. Okay. So, so, so. Be louder. I, I agree with Gloria. Did they wash? And why would they bury themselves up to their head, up to their necks, in sand? <laughs> yeah, we talked a little bit last week about the sand oh, and the, no, that's okay. I was just trying to remember what we said. It was okay. to save the clothes. Yeah. You're saving the clothes and they had to stay modest. Yeah, yeah, but what a way to save clothes. Why don't I just put them on a yeah, chair? Yeah, it was a way of making sure their clothing didn't wear out, but... Um, but they had to stay modest when they were, they were studying. Right. But we didn't discuss the nitty gritty. Oh, you uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna move us forward. So let's see what where this goes in the so creative proud. retelling of this tale. The opening conversation in this story probably took place at a party, perhaps a wedding feast. So this is unusual for Ruth Calderon. He's she's starting far away mm -hmm. from the story in the third person. Where might we be? And she's telling us, I'm going to imagine where we might be based on the dynamic being kind of a cluster of people schmoozing. Where else would they be schmoozing? At a party. And what kind of party would rabbis attend? They wouldn't attend just a social party. It would have to be a wedding. That's where the religious people would go to a party. <clears throat> These were days of persecution and destruction, and happiness was hard to come by. But the sages could be counted upon to bring joy to the bride and groom to eat meat and drink wine, right? It's a mitzvah mm -hmm. to, to be- Misamea hatan v'kala. Thank you, Sandra, exactly. Terrible rumors <clears throat> circulated each day about the authorities' relentless persecution. One man was executed for wrapping tefillin on his arm. Women were raped and slaughtered on their return from the ritual bath. No one could forget the image of Rabbi Hanania ben Tradion, who was burned by the Romans while wrapped in a Torah scroll uttering his haunting final words. The scrolls are burning, but the letters are flying up to heaven. Oof. Oh, yeah. He who will take revenge for the humiliation of Torah will also take revenge for me. So what she's doing for us is reminding us that Romans being in charge was really, really oppressive. It was an oppressive time. And it was, it was illegal to study and it was illegal to rebel against the authorities. But you don't, you don't cease weddings, right? Life goes on. So where else would they be schmoozing at, but at this wedding, which is an act of rebellion in many ways, mm -hmm, just being mm -hmm. at a religious wedding. The marriage ceremony, which had been undertaken hastily, was finished. Young men from the village were stationed along the way to send warning in the event that Roman soldiers should approach. So that's the backdrop. I mean, why else? If someone mm -hmm. just spoke words, that would be a crime. Words against the authority. So she has to remind us why it would have been a crime for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to say, eh, they're bathhouses, they're bridges. They sat together at one table, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, mm -hmm. Rabbi Yehuda, and Rabbi Yossi. Mm -hmm. Yehuda ben Gerim, so he's an outsider. We talked last mm -hmm. time about Gerim is convert, so he's a descendant of convert. He's being labeled here. A little bit anti convert, I don't know, other. othered yet. Mm -hmm. um, approached and sat among them. Out of politeness, they did not dismiss him, but they also were not guarded with their words, perhaps because they were tired or because they never expected that he would betray them. Right? He is one of, one mm -hmm. of them. So why would he betray them? So they spoke freely. Rabbi Yehuda began speaking freely. There we go, mm -hmm. trying to offer some measure of consolation. It is possible that it is only the short-sightedness of the Romans that causes them not to believe in our God. They're not savages. He downed the remains of his wine and said, everything they do is done well. Bridges, marketplaces, back houses. We no longer live in a small village buried in dust. We're practically a city now. We can buy Roman fabrics, medicine, spices. You can't deny that our babies are healthier. And are women happier? What's he saying? Progress. Yeah. We see it's progress. The Romans aren't all bad. Look what they've brought. Look at civilization has changed. When no one responded, he continued. And there's nothing so bad about frequenting a bathhouse. It could even be considered a ritual bath if it includes some rainwater. <laughs> and the bridges they built, this is the first winter without flooding. Chariots are not getting stuck in the mud, and animals are not washing away in the rains. So now he's really mm -hmm. praising them. And we can incorporate modernity into our Jewish lives, make it a ritual bath, mm -hmm. a mikvah. So he's not only saying they're okay, we should embrace this, helping our society. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai looked at him, and his face grew stern. A tense silence descended over the table. It was clear from his expression that Bar Yochai did not look favorably upon such talk about the conquering Romans. He rested his wine cup on the table and pushed away the platter of meat. 
Yehuda ben Gerim giggled embarrassingly. He could not bear the weight of the silence. Mm -hmm. So this is her way of painting the silence because the other guy didn't say anything because there's silence. And so now only Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is going to speak. Mm -hmm. And he's a little bit of a, an extremist, you could say. I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah. well, he has a, a, a different position, a, a very, um, also one-sided position. Mm -hmm. Finally, Bar Yochai began speaking bitterly. Everything they built was for themselves. They built marketplaces for, to quarter harlots. They built bathhouses to beautify their own bodies. They built bridges to collect tolls. So that's exactly what's mm -hmm. in the Talmud text. I think I saw a chat. Is it a private chat to me? It was a private chat to me. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Glad you're here. Um, no one said anything. Rabbi Yossi looked from Ben Gerim on his one side to Bar Yochai on his other. He trembled. That's the one staying silent. Yeah. Stuck in between. He's not sure what to say. Everyone at the table was visibly uncomfortable. When all the other men approached the groom to begin the dancing without musical instruments because it was too dangerous, these four went their separate ways as if trying to disentangle themselves from a distressing predicament. Hmm. Rabbi Yossi too, did. Was not. it too dangerous because they're afraid the Romans would hear? Mm -hmm. I think so, yes, yes. Again, this is she's adding color to the story. She's adding dimensions that aren't inherent in the text. So if you had a wedding feast, she's made a lot of assumptions here. Where are they hanging out? They're at a party. What kind of party would it be? A wedding. What kind of wedding would it be? A sort of hastily put together and top secret wedding, lest the Romans hear about it. They're doing a religious wedding. Um, and so, yeah, she adds this dimension of, oh, no instruments, because that would be too dangerous. Everybody would hear the instruments. Rabbi Yossi did not stop trembling. He wanted to ask Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai a question, but he did not dare approach him. A few days passed. It became known that Yehuda ben Gerim had gone and related their conversation to someone else who had told someone else who was an associate of the Romans. So remember, we noticed mm -hmm. that in the text also, that it was told like he told someone and then it was told to the Romans. So she explicitly says it that way. Yeah. So she's a close reader of the text and we're a close reader of her text. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. From mouth to mouth, the rumors spread and swelled until Bar Yochai's words reached the Roman authorities. Ben Gerim seemed to have disappeared. He no longer frequented the neighborhood surrounding the study house. As in less troubled times, Rabbi Shimon and his famous son, Rabbi al -Azhar, could be found in the study house from dawn to dusk. So they didn't change their behavior. Mm -hmm. They still go to the Beit Midrash every day. But the implication is, you know, in troubled times, not everybody is doing that. They did exactly what they did in less troubled times. They're risking their lives. Mm -hmm. They've seen Rabbi Hananib and Tribune up in smoke for, um, you know, for, for studying and teaching Torah. But they are sticking with it. When carpenters, cobblers, roofers, bloodletters, right, those are the healers, yeah. <laughs> and other members of the community would come to the study house after work, still dressed in their soiled work clothes, resting the tools of their trade on the benches, the noise and the filth they brought with them would annoy the father and son who were absorbed in their learning. So already here, she's foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. Workers, they can't value their work already now, even before they've entered a cave. They're already in the cave of the Beit Midrash. It was obvious from their words and their man mannerisms that not only did they not respect the workers who came to learn, mm -hmm. sweaty and tanned after a day of hard labor, they also resented how these men would fill the study house with the smells and sounds of the outside world. Before these workers arrived, the study house was all theirs, dark, overcast, Cool with only the sounds of learning audible. There was a pronounced tension between the father and the son, whose entire beings longed for Torah, and the disciples of Rabbi Ishmael, who supported integrating Torah study into a productive working life. So this is a debate mm -hmm. that, of course, she's giving voice to a very modern debate as well. Do you stay in the yeshiva 
or do you believe that one can study Torah and also work? Torah Umada, we talked mm -hmm. about this a little bit. Modern Orthodoxy, um, uh, religious Zionism, we're building a state, but we're also learning Torah. Um, this was, uh, we've seen this in so many of Ruth's um, uh, stories. Remember Rish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Yochanan is white and gentle, and Rish Lakish is rough and tan because he's been outside. The Yeshiva Bachrim are inside and they're pale <laughs> and bony or whatever. So can you can you live in both worlds? Mm -hmm. That's that's the question on the table throughout this story. Can you live in both worlds? Um, Still on. Or yeah, or um, is it one or the other? What happens if you fully embrace the outside world? Do you become heathens like the Romans? Uh, can you know what happens if you if you seclude yourself in the Beit Midrash? Do you believe that then bridges are useless <laughs> and bathhouses and who's going to be your kosher butcher? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's not going to be a Roman. I think <laughs> we're going to get there at the end that mm. we need both. Yeah. Right. We need someone who's immersed in the ivory tower of learning. And we also need the people who are carpenters and butchers. But both need to really value But can the carpenter other. come That's and do dafyomi at the end of the day after a day of work? And can the yeshiva student also learn a trade? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. She 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 mm -hmm. she foreshadows mm -hmm. this debate between materialism and intellectualism. And she says earlier than when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai before just before he started his his um, his um, uh, advocacy against you know he spoke bitterly against the what the Romans did it, she says he rested his wine cup on the table and pushed away the platter of meat mm, mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. you know I, I, this is all material stuff this is this is not he where was we should focus. Eating, but now something more important came along and but, meat and wine are a means to an end for sameach hatan vekala as we said you know giving joy to the bride and group it's a mitzvah. But now this is- He was being thing. dramatic. Yeah, but I think yeah, maybe, also- Maybe that too. <laughs> honestly, honestly. And, and actually, I'll just say one more thing because I'm, I'm taking a creative writing class now, which has oh. been just lots of fun, an online class. Um, and, uh, and I'm learning that when you do that, sort of, you know, the, the, the woman pushed her hair out of her eyes and leaned in. <laughs> like something, I just made that up, but- uh, that was pauses good. the was conversation, good. <laughs> pauses the conversation so that the reader feels the silence. Mm -hmm. You can't say there was silence every single time. <laughs> so they have to be doing something. And so he puts down his wine, pushes away the meat, you know, and then comes up with a response. She took the same class, I guess. Right? I guess she yeah. did. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think I think the conversation at the beginning is kind of foreshadowing of of what we're seeing here in the sense that. They're arguing that uh, between uh, is colonialism a good thing or uh -huh. a bad thing? Uh -huh. So right. the elitism, right. the elites mm -hmm. of that environment are the colonialists who do things for themselves, but somebody, but they're saying, well, but it's good for everybody. Right. And right. but if the colonialists are shunning the indigenous culture and not allowing mm. them to practice their religious faith. Mm -hmm. then it's oppressive. It's, it's oppressive. It's oppressive. Yeah. So they don't yeah. have the clarity of vision yeah. to see, oh, our babies aren't dying. Yeah. <laughs> we have, you know, better, better handle mm -hmm. on disease mm -hmm. and, and the animals aren't being washed away in the flood because their very <laughs> souls are being denied. But the Romans were not always and, this oppressive, by the way. You know, this is, this is, this is a very small window mm -hmm. of an empire that lasted for 300 years. Absolutely. And Absolutely. during a lot of that time, <clears throat> They didn't care what religions people practiced. They didn't care. They, as long as they kept the the, the peace, really? and as long as they paid their taxes, uh -huh. and as long as they didn't make trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, but with the, but this is at a time where they're destroying our temple. And this, yes, this right. This, there, there is a it's clear. Yes. This is a clear time of oppression, and maybe yeah. then once the threat is quashed, they can. But they had been. But they had been. Down. The Roman Empire started well before Julius Caesar, in the sense that. Mm -hmm. They had been extending their their uh, hegemony over lands surrounding them for hundreds of years before. So this is a very modern debate as well. Mm -hmm. Can there be a friendly colonialism? Mm -hmm. Is that even that possible? debate is going on today? Mm -hmm. I actually have I actually have um, I, I keep all the reviews of there are 
it's very it's very unpopular to be a pro colonialism mm -hmm. advocate mm -hmm. because that's mm -hmm. like yeah. colonialism is considered one of the mm -hmm. great evils. Mm -hmm. And if you say, yeah, but there was good in it today, you'll get canceled. You'll get of course, yes, of yeah. course yeah. But, but there have been some very intelligent books written lately on how the British Empire was a much better empire than, say, uh, the Spanish and the French. And, like, they were less interested only in extracting from their colonies uh, the wealth and the this and the right, that. Right. They, they were, were actually wanting to impose a kind of so order education, yes. infrastructure, which is why their colonies turned out to stay friendly. With and yet we overthrew the British Empire in Palestine. So that well, we they, have they, our yeah, nation. Oh, but country. they, they double-crossed us. That's a whole other thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying that we have, that it's, yeah. com it's a yeah. complex, this is why this is a great story, yeah. right? Yeah. If it was black and white, it wouldn't make for a good story. Mm -hmm. So there's a complexity here and, and Rome isn't, all bad, mm -hmm. but Rome does become the enemy. Uh, yes, morally, ethically, religiously, and uh, and we, because of that, we're um, we're refusing to see the good. That's the debate yes, at yes, the table. Yes. I see David wanted to say something there. No, no, no. Okay, not this let's David. Keep, let's, keep <laughs> let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. So. Uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, talk about extremism, mm -hmm. said in no uncertain terms that he considered war to be a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. It's true, Barbara, you need the butcher, but that's, I mean, because you have to eat something. It's necessary evil. In the end of days, Olam Haba, uh, or uh, at Messianic times, Torah scholars would not need to waste time working. He quoted a verse from the Bible about that future era. Strangers shall stand and pasture your flocks. Aliens shall be your plowmen and vine trimmers. In other words, Jews won't need to work. The other <laughs> nations hire people who do it. And uh, hire the Gentiles to do all of our dirty work. Uh, kind, kind of, of an alien. Yeah, talk about an alien. Really, you want to enslave the whole world. Yeah. Well, it's, it's Rabbi Shmuel turned red when he heard this and responded with another verse. You shall gather in your new grain and wine and oil. Mm -hmm. He interpreted the verse as follows. You shall gather, that is you and not a servant or a non-Jew. That's holy work to yeah. work the land of Israel. So those are the early Zionists, the yeah. Halutzim, working the land. Yes. <laughs> working the land is part of our ideology. Mm -hmm. And this is a mitzvah mm -hmm. of Yeshua Aretz, of settling the land, of draining the swamps, of mm -hmm. harvesting. And we have ritual with harvesting. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's actually a beautiful mm -hmm. way to use that verse. Was it Rabbi who and, said? Uh, I'm sorry? Rabbi Cook. Rabbi Cook. Uh, yes. yes, yes, the first chief rabbi of, of Palestine, mm -hmm. saying this is um, this is holy. holy work. Yeah, he went yeah. on to speak about the merit of honest labor and the sin of using Torah as a means of attaining some other goal. Mm -hmm. The tension between the two did not dissipate. So this wasn't in the original mm -hmm. story, but she's highlighting this debate really beautifully. Mm -hmm. Bar Yochai continued learning with his son from dawn to dusk. And the students of Rabbi Ishmael continue to show up in the afternoon proud to have first put in a day's work. It's honest, good labor. After a while, Bar Yochai and his son would return home only on the Sabbath eve. So they, they, they stayed in the Beit Midrash morning and night. Mm -hmm. It was a difficult and tiring journey to the study house, especially in the summer heat. And it seemed to them a shame to waste precious hours of learning mm -hmm. on the travel there and back. So now they're dorming. <laughs> <laughs> and yeshiva instead they would cover benches with cloth that they found in the attic mm. they slept only only sporadically so that one day's learning blended into that of the next with time the noise and the news from the outside world became more and more distressing mm. the dream of fleeing to a cave began to take shape Ooh. so isn't it nice the yes. way she's showing us? how did they come up with this idea yeah how do you just wake up one day and said let's hide in a cave well, you've already built yourself a cave. You don't go home anymore. You're <laughs> sleeping on the bench. They didn't you know that. They, they didn't know the term couch surfing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, yeah. They, you know, the, now going into the cave is not such a far cry from mm -hmm. what they're already doing. Yeah. Interesting. So she fills that in very nicely. And why are they doing this? Let's just flesh it out even more. It's multiple reasons. There's the threat of the Romans that gets them started. 
but there's something else it's here. It's the passion of the learning. They don't want to do anything else. else. Like, and the, also um, the defilement of the outside world in some way, or the derision of, of work and labor as So this is a, a cautionary tale about being too judgmental. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> I'm going back to my original. Uh -huh. Why were they told to go back into the? Because there's something about judging uh -huh. and not living in another person's shoes and just judging that's not as good as what we do. So I think the challenging question is, you don't have to answer it right now. Do we need people, we, the Jewish community, does the Jewish community need people like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai? Do we need someone to be in the, in the Beit Midrash morning, noon, and night to sustain Torah? And do they need someone to be out plowing the fields? Does the story tell us in the end that we need that? Or that it's, a, is that a necessary evil? I'm a Libra, so you know my answer. <laughs> you what? I'm a Libra, so you know my so answer. Possible. But do you understand what I'm asking? Like, oh, are they 100% wrong? So let's see where the story ends. Okay. okay. Days and weeks passed and the fear of the authorities grew. The non-Jewish water carrier who had a special affinity for the sages of the study house came to warn that Bar Yochai's name had appeared on the list of those slated for execution. Serve as an example to the public of what happens to those who rebel against the authorities. Not to those who study Torah full time, but the rebellion here. Bar Yochai was to be crucified. And remember that was common. Yeah. It wasn't just Jesus. The water carrier warned, entreating him to make himself scarce. Thugs began harassing Bar Yochai's wife in the marketplace on her way home to bring food for her husband and son. She worried about what would become of her. So not just they don't trust her. Again, Ruth Calderon is giving voice to the women in the story again and again and again. Mm -hmm. She is worried. It would be better for you to be seen as having no connection with us, Bar Yochai told her on the last Sabbath that he spent at home. She did not respond. So it's not that she doesn't have a voice, but she doesn't know what to say. She did not know which was worse, that he had endangered her life or that he planned to take her son away with him. Oy, oy, oy. Yeah. yeah. Before midnight, Bar Yochai and his son set out from home carrying food and provisions for many days. Bar Yochai did not sleep with his wife that night. He could not bear to watch her cry. So he's not completely callous. He feels her pain. This is and he feels like that he's, oh, that's interesting. He's doing what he needs to do and he's leaving her in the process. Yeah. What did you say? So this is Abraham and Isaac. Before Abraham takes Isaac. He... So now we're in the cave. Exactly. Okay, fast forward to the cave. In the beginning, the sorrow of the cave was the sorrow of being torn from his wife and from the outside world. So he's not so happy being there. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. He once again remembered that conversation at the wedding feast and the expression on the face of Yehuda ben Gerim. Now he wanted to rip him apart like a fish. He kicked the wall of the cave in, in anger. And at night before he fell asleep, he planned what he would do to Ben Gary when he could emerge from the cave. So he's very upset to be confined to this cave. He doesn't really want to be here, but he sees it as necessary because of the authorities. And it's interesting that in our original um, story in the Talmud, this aspect is left out. We have no, yes. we right. have no feeling that he is being torn from the outside world or that he cares about being separated from his wife. It's like either yeah. it's left out on purpose or he doesn't feel it in the, the Talmud story. Yeah, or it's irrelevant to the message of- it's um, irrelevant to the main and, message, that's true. Yeah, yeah. And I like that she's pausing to give us um, at least a, a sense that, you know, what would happen in those first few days and weeks alone in a cave for anyone it would be really really hard mm -hmm. it's a normal it's a, she's she's putting in a normal expression of what a person would likely yeah. feel from being torn away from his normal life and yet she goes on after a while the world seemed farther and farther away and his anger dissipated the father and son did not know how long their provisions would last one morning, the young Elazar was awakened by the sound of bubbling water. <clears throat> so here's the miracle. He got up and found a spring welling up from inside a carob tree. 
He slaked his thirst with the cold, sweet water whose taste was as deep and rich as the finest wine. Only then did he notice that the tree was filled with carobs, sweet as honey. They did not know if the miracle was the creation of the carob tree uh, or, and the fountain or the sudden opening of their eyes. But from that day on, they never had to worry about food and drink. They left the remains of their stale bread and stagnant water for the crows. Now they don't need anything that they had brought from the outside world. After that, they stopped getting dressed. Okay, so now we're gradually, slowly letting go of the outside world. Their clothes felt too heavy against their bodies. And because no one was around, clothing seemed unnecessary. They were sitting there on the ground when El Azar began to dig. <laughs> Only in the sand could he find peace. At first, the pile of sand served as his pillow. The hardness of the rock and the bar bare cave made the soft sand a welcome source of comfort. After a while, his father joined in. Together, they dug mattresses out of the earth. From day to day, they continued digging deeper and deeper. Eventually, their bodies were entirely underground with only their heads still visible. So again, how did they dig themselves and hide neck up in the sand? It happened gradually. First, they needed a little cushion. Mm -hmm. It was better than the rock. Then they liked that feeling of being covered with the sand. <laughs> and finally, yeah, but... they're, they're just these little heads. Yeah. Just talking, yeah, but... talking. <laughs> but can you imagine... Can you imagine being confined like that, unable to move? And what about bathroom need, needs? You know, to me, yeah, it's, 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 that's to torture. It's like well, cat, Chinese, you know, Chinese women working in the field needle. would put their children, the babies, in bags of sand oh, with yeah? their heads really? sticking out. Yes, so that- But babies like being constricted. Yes. Yeah. Right, and, they, and that way they didn't need diapers or anything because the sand would absorb the- Yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's the so origin of cats. And they would put them under a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Or I should say, <laughs> they would put them yeah. under a tree. Then. In they a put them in the shade. They put them in the shade while they worked. Yeah. In, in the rice paddies yeah, or whatever. Need that one. And uh, they didn't need baby. Well, who had babysitters? And no, everybody had to work. So um, uh, here, so she described it. They were comfortable that way. The shape of the sand accommodated itself to their figures. And the natural warm, warmth mm -hmm. of their bodies became accustomed <laughs> to the warmth of the surrounding sand. Their position underground provided refuge from the heat of the day and enabled them to retain some of that heat during the cold mm -hmm. nights. They emerged only for prayer, putting on their clothes as if they were uniforms before yeah. they began to pray. They wore their clothes for no more than an hour a day. Maybe that's also mm -hmm. when they would go to relieve themselves. Mm -hmm. As a result, their clothes did not suffer wear and tear, but were spread out like new on the branches of the carob tree, as if waiting for father and son to come out of the cave, immerse their bodies in water, and put them on. Nice. It's very nice. It is nice. It's a lovely existence. She, she makes things much more um, um, natural mm. because, as yeah. you said, things happen. There's a transition. Things happen, you know, the sand is a pillow, then it becomes right, a solar capsule. Right, right. But I'm it also doesn't sound so crazy. It doesn't sound so crazy. And she demiraculizes it, if that's a word. Yes. Yeah. But the, did you notice how she says the spring came from the carob tree? Yes. That's not what the original text no. said. So she's finding a way for the spring to be also natural. Right. Came the carob tree roots are are, are, yeah. are drawing up the water and the spring is coming from the tree. She's making Giving it less miraculous. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, it's still one day. And she even says one day they just saw it there. Was it that God brought it miraculously or they just finally yeah. opened their eyes mm. to it? Mm. Right. Like Jonah. It's it. like, yeah. Yeah. And it's like Ishmael and Hagar. Yeah. That, uh, I think it's Matipa Kaha and Ishmael. I think that their eyes were opened. Mm. Oh, yeah. I feel like Becky's going to tell me. <laughs> 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 Listen. Um, she's, she's listening. Okay, so let's 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 get through twelve years now. Okay. Twelve years passed like one long day. <laughs> <laughs> Every moment was spent immersed in the study of Torah. In that perfect partnership of father and son, mm -hmm. they spoke wow. the same language. Only occasionally did they need to discuss anything other than Torah. Mm -hmm. Bar Yochai functioned as a living book. I love that. Yeah. He would quote verses or portions from memory. 
and he and his son would study them together. There was no dimension to time other than light and darkness. Mm -hmm. They knew the appropriate time for prayer by the shadows that slanted over the opening of the cave. <clears throat> when darkness fell, sleep seized hold of them. Their lives in the cave brought them closer to the birds, rodents, and jackals that commanded the various watches of their waking hours. <laughs> so they became like animals, which is so interesting mm -hmm. because what's the difference between animals and people? Words. A a words, but they're speaking. People... Um, change their environment by plowing, sowing, building, um, creating. They're, they're only creating words. Mm -hmm. Oh, but that's what they got. That's, being that's the dream to be disembodied from the, it, you know, it's one thing to be disembodied from work or to be withdraw from work. Then you withdraw from your own body and eventually you're, you are just a talking head. Mm. And that is mm. their idea of, of, Wonderful, right? But I'm thinking of fantasy. Plato's cave, Plato's famous cave. Yeah, you have where, to come out of the cave. Well, when you're in the cave, all you see is shadows on the yeah. wall. You don't see yeah. the truth. You don't see. Yeah. You only I, see the shadow of the truth, mm -hmm. and it keeps mm -hmm. coming back to me. Plato's yeah, I was cave. thinking about the cave yeah. Plato's cave. But I think there's another aspect because mm. before in their life, they were in the Beit Midrash. They were away from nature. They were keeping the keeping nature and the rest of the world outside. Now they're in the cave and they're coming more in contact with nature. And it's not mm. so much they're becoming like animals, but they're becoming more aware of all, you know, the birds and the roosters wake That's them true. up in the morning. It's yeah. more, I, I don't see it as, That's I don't see it. Mm -hmm. mm. Right. Ironically, being there secluded from people makes them more one with the, the rest of nature. of nature. Yeah. So it says in the morning, the chirping of the birds would wake them before sunrise. And at night, they would fall asleep along with the muffled rustling sound that filled the expanse of the cave. They never entered the cave's more distant recesses, mm. as if an unstated gentleman's <laughs> agreement <laughs> limited them to the one great room that was close to the entrance. The shrieking of the jackals at night broke into their dreams, figuring in the longing of the son and the anxieties of the father. Mm. So they are one, they're one with the animals of the cave. At first, when Elijah came and stood at the entrance of the cave, he did not see them. Then he lowered his gaze. Rabbi Shimo, so he came looking for them and it's like, didn't he was looking heads? for people and he couldn't find people. <laughs> Rabbi Shimon and his son were buried in the sand with only their heads visible, facing each other like two cherubs in a garden. Garden gnomes. Garden gnomes. I thought of the Kruvim, these gods. The, yeah, the Kruvim on the on the Yaron. And in between them are the word of God. Yeah, nice. Um, um and uh thank you. I I've, I have a chat from Michael. People have the ability to think in cognitively that animals cannot, right? So that's what they have. They're just their heads. <clears throat> they were absorbed into the Torah. <clears throat> Over the years, they, their daily learning had developed into a whole new approach to Torah study. They were innovating, binding Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to his son so closely, mm -hmm. such that speaking with him was like speaking with himself. Mm -hmm. Elijah knew that he had come to the right place by the clothes that were spread over the carrot <laughs> trees by the cave's entrance. He spoke gently into the open space of the cave not wanting to intrude. It was better this way for Bar Yochai and his son. Let's break the news gently. They heard him call, who will inform Bar Yochai and his son that the Caesar, Caesar has died and his decree has been annulled? Mm -hmm. And then he fled guess, and disappeared. Guess who? <laughs> <laughs> guess who? <laughs> Quite a while passed before they understood what they had heard. A distant memory flashed before Bar Yochai, the hated face of Yehuda ben Geri. So now he just barely remembers that thing that he was so angry about. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I hated him once. That's why we're here. I forgot why we were even here. They emerged from the cave. They rinsed themselves, dressed, and stood outside the cave <coughs> as the noon sun heated the earth. 
They saw men plowing and sowing. Fields were stretched out to the west of the cave atop a mountain that received the majority of the rainfall. Pairs of animals led by workers approached plottingly <laughs> over the unplowed fields as if wading through water. They are forsaking the eternal by preoccupying themselves with the mundane, the father commented to his son. He did not know if he was eulogizing himself or the field workers. So that's a commentary right there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Who died? Is, did, did he lose a piece of himself or have the workers lost their souls? Mm -hmm. They looked over to the mountain that lay before them. Smoke flared up between the rocks like bonfires of leaves built by farmers. One of the cows shrieked when flames leapt at its foot. Mm -hmm. Slowly they came to realize that the fire was blazing forth from their own eyes. They were careful not to look directly at anyone. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to harm them, but they realized they, this is what they were creating. Mm -hmm. The world was silent for a moment, as if its master had frozen everything to speak just to them in a heavenly voice. Have you emerged in order to destroy my world? Return to your cave. This was without a doubt a rebuke. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> rebuke. I never read it that way. I forgot the chance said that. But for the father and son, the rebuke was a form of salvation. Their clothes felt uncomfortable against their bodies. The light of day burned their eyes. Right? The burning was two yes, ways. Yes. yes. And the futility of endless plowing insulted their sensibilities. In the cave, the sand was like the body of an enchanting woman that drew them back mm -hmm. to bury themselves in it. Whoa. Woo. Oh, that's dangerous. Create within it the beauty of Torah. To shine forth with new interpretation. To create a new Torah in the darkness. But this is, it's yeah. creative. Yeah. Utility of endless plowing. What are they doing? I mean, the endless plowing is going to grow a field of wheat or but corn it's or just, something. It's just chaye sha'a, it's temporary life, as opposed to chaye olam, the eternal, eternal, eternal life. life. How can you forsake chaye olam, eternity, to spend time in chaye sha'a, in temporal but, but again, this is That's it's how the, they, the endless yeah, plowing is what keeps you know, yeah, that body and soul together. It's begging so. you to answer that, yeah. right? Yeah. The family... Right. But there, have, let's just finish this because I'm conscious of our time. A family had been created there in the cave. They had, yeah. not only is the wife not there, they have a new wife and mother. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, why she uses that analogy. Image uh, the father, the son, and the big cave mother. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a trinity. What a trinity. They never contradicted that one. Right. <laughs> they could not leave until the kid was ready to birth them. Ooh. Yeah. It was a gift that they had been granted more time to live together like fetuses in the womb. Yeah. So that's how I had always saw it. I had always seen it. That they needed a little more time to cultivate them to be kind of more robust and ready for the outside mm -hmm. world. When a year had passed and the heavenly voice commanded them to come out, <laughs> they were ready. Mm -hmm. This time it was dusk when they emerged. So they learned, don't go out at noon. <laughs> 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 they came My out with lowered eyelids, mentioned. worried that their eyes would once again blaze forth with fire. Mm. A convoy of field workers and their cattle appeared far off in the distant village on the slopes of the green hill. Elazar looked at them, and gray smoke appeared behind the convoy. There was a momentary flare, and then immediately Bar Yochai's glance extinguished the fire. Mm. Then the sun ignited a nearby tree, and once again the father extinguished it. That's what was described, right? Yeah. Bar uh, Rabbi Elazar looked at his father and his cheeks turned bright with anger. <clears throat> the father rested his hand against his son's cheek and the fire quieted. Shimon Bar Yochai looked into the eyes of his son and said, enough son, the world can suffice with me and you. <laughs> Very confusing. Yeah. A little bit confusing, a little bit confusing. So we're going to keep going like this, father and son. You're going to be the passion, the passionate fire of the, of the cave, of the Torah that we had made together. And I'm going to be the, I don't know, force that tempers that yeah. flame. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this? Who's right in the end? This is checks and balances. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. this, yeah. this is a series. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it as a metaphor, 
and, and uh, you know, instead of light that was actual physical light that was lasers that could burn something at a distance, we would say stink eye. They were giving people the stink eye. These were Jews working in the field. Yes. Jews aren't supposed to work in the field. The non-Jews, let the non-Jews do that. We have Torah to do, right. and that's our job. Their job is to, is to as, as Barbara said, to put food on the table, to allow us to have food on the table. And now they, the God said, no, go, go back in the cave. And they spent another year. And then the father, during that year, the father figured it out. And yet the son didn't. And the son didn't. Yeah. So they need to it's stay a process. Side side. It's a process. I'm wondering what's going to happen when they see their wife, mother, when they see her. Is she, are they going to want to be with her? Is the father going to want to be with her and the son is going to shun the family? Is he going to wander off to be ascetic for the rest of his life? Is he going to go back to the cave by himself? Well, when you have that long separation from a parent, mm -hmm. uh, alienation can result because uh, if you don't spend a certain amount of time, literal time, with parents, um, you can break that bond. And what we said last week also mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. this time, this 12 years, is a much larger uh, percentage of the child's of the son's life. life. Yes. <laughs> and what about the mother? You know, who knows what yeah, happened to her in 12 her. years? We don't get to meet her at the end. Now she'll have all those dirty clothes to wash. <laughs> <laughs> they only each had one she had a vacation so up until then. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to read to you. So I actually was confused by Ruth Calderon's conclusion. I want to read to you. Mm -hmm. What reflection? So she talks about um, how they emerge from the cave with the world will suffice. Mm -hmm. But, um, and Rabbi Rechai's statement suggests a shift in focus from the public arena of struggle against the Roman to the private domain of the cave. Um, and that, that mm -hmm. the Torah war life, it, it goes beyond anything of time and space. But towards the end, he says, she says, um, Okay, there's a shift. Uh, emerging from the cave is difficult. Life is less rich and more impoverished mm -hmm. for them. There's a shift from the internal, personal world to the external world of conversation with others. And she says it's like awakening from a dream to then the reality of daily interaction. It's very hard to give up the dream. And, um, and you don't know which one is more real. Dream you, life. Think, are you reading from the text? Because I can't. So now I just went to her book, and I don't always bring you all of her yeah. reflections in the book. That's why you have to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to read to you how she ends, um, where she asks, "Will they be able to integrate both mm -hmm. worlds right. wi without losing one of them?" Sure. And then she says, "Her last sentence is, uh, I feel a little strange." So tell me what you think. Mm -hmm. I'm, so I'm reading from something you don't have here on your handout. She says, ultimately, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son demonstrate that those who remain devoted to a creative cultural tradition will emerge victorious against any conquering power. Oh, Those who remain devoted mm -hmm. to a creative cultural tradition, a tradition that is, is creative the way it was created in the cave, I guess, yeah. will emerge victorious against the conquering power. The conquering power died. They're still here, and so they won. So she is. She is actually. What's she doing? She seems to be <laughs> ascribing to their action of retreating from the world and, and doing all that as if they had saved the Jewish people. Yeah, I, so, I, they saved Torah because they kept Torah going, and then they came out. But when they came out, they. There was there was a tension there. Like I don't know why she's saying that, unless she's doubling down on the word creative, yeah. creative cultural tradition that yeah. it didn't stay that static, we adapt that we adapt that they could bring new Torah. I don't know what she's saying here. But could she also be glossing okay. over? I think she's glossing over the the friction that exists between like yeah. the father and the son have different. Yeah, I think that's what it's all about, and she's like ignoring it. Yeah, she's glossing over it. What Marilyn here in the room has something to add. I know. I was just thinking about Ruth Calderon's political agenda, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which is yeah. to reinforce the concept that Torah learning is valid in and of itself, mm -hmm. yeah. and that the Haredi should be supported. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. You, see you think that's a political agenda? That to that Torah study is important, but she doesn't think it's important um, in isolation from from secular life. She wants I don't to be know. These people become abstractions of people. 
But they're, she's ignoring she, she's ignoring the end of the, the end of the story in the Talmud, and that's very different. Right, right. I, I, that's how yeah. I felt. The end of the story in the Talmud is that they finally realize that the temporal world is important as well. When they yeah, see the, right. that man carrying the shamor of the zahor, and they ask him, "What are you doing?" It's Arab Shabbos, and he said, "This is shamor, and this is zahor." They realize that you can be within the Torah world, within yes. the within the real world. Yes. And she yes. isn't really not directing that, really. Not but directing she, at all. She's thinking about it vis-a-vis -vis the authorities, the Roman authorities. Like they're gone and we're still here learning Torah. I think but that's a historical comment. If you think of all of the the, the one time all of the cultures that have, have tried to eradicate us and we're still here. And why are we still here? Because we hold to to certain uh, creative traditional beliefs. We hold fast. We ho it's not just that we hold fast to, to the Torah. Is to subjugate us. But, but that's We're not still here. But that's not only to, uh, our our existence today is largely centered yeah. on Israel, which was created by the non-religious. And and you could say that the the the, the religious people kept the dream alive. Of, of well, I'm know. still here, and yeah. I'm not in Israel. I, I'm still. But, in, but Israel no, is I, now the center. Israel is more highly populated with Jews at this point than any than all the rest of the world put together. Uh, so so it's, then this is actually so she when she talks about the reality and the dream, and then she mm -hmm. says it's like, will they be able to fulfill the verse Hayinu Kecholim? We were as dreamers. Mm -hmm. That's about the return to Zion. Yeah. We were as dreamers. So we had a dream, and then we went and plowed the fields to make that dream a reality. Yeah. And yeah. As you're saying, the people who plowed those fields were secular. She's now trying to say, you don't have to be um, assuming, you don't have to ignore Torah yeah. to be the dreamer that builds the land. I, you can I be think both. You can be both, mm -hmm. and that will sustain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but you need her Zionism. You need right? And that's her agenda. Yes. Yeah. 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 It yeah. it, it's the so, argument between body and soul, to me. Yeah. Right, so the, right. The soul and is Torah, and the body is, is, is human need. But you need both. You need yeah. both. Yes, yes, of right. course you need both. Yeah. And the truth is that a lot of that... This was the... Wait, excuse me, Sandra. This was the dilemma that Ben-Gurion had to address when he established Israel. And um, how do you incorporate mm -hmm. the religious mm -hmm. people who were there already yeah. and the Zionists who came to work the land? But they were in small and numbers. The, in small numbers. They were in small numbers. Yes, we're not bringing it forward. But at that time, that was his dilemma. His solution was to incorporate both. Now, as we go forward mm -hmm. in the in time, we see the evolution of mm -hmm. that and the acceptance. Anyway, we won't go yeah. further. Well, yeah. But that, that's where I mean you have these incredibly passionate divides between the secular and yeah, the religious. And, and, and that yeah. tension and that Our tension rules. is pervasive. Not just uh, in the past, uh, but in Israel today. In, in the society. And Becky, you wanted to say something there? I wanted to say that that we we have a very skated idea of what of, of what, what what went on during the times of the Talmud. There were a lot of rabbinim that had trades. They 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 would work. That is how they were able to support their families, not through Torah. In right. other words, it wasn't scholarship through Torah. It was they they had to be a sundlar or or or, or, or they had to have some kind of a trade, whether it was an hour or whether it was more than that, but. They didn't oh. sit 24 hours and just learn Torah. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the exception to right. the rule. Right. He's the mystic. He's the yeah. ascetic. He's, yeah. yeah, he's not, thank you. Yeah, he's not the majority. So whew, yeah, we've yeah. reached the end of our hour with a wow. heated debate that it's is very, uh, <laughs> very much in play yeah. until today, not only in Israel, but across major Jewish population centers in North America and all around the world. Um, and the Talmud, when you reach the end of an argument that cannot be resolved, the Talmud says the Eat. word teku, which Eat. means we mean, which means let's leave it as an open argument. We won't 